Thank you very much, Marilyn, and thank you all very much for, for coming and listening. It's a great honour. I hardly need to tell you what an honour it is to stand here and uh, speak in this company and in, on this occasion, so I'm um, extremely grateful to be asked. I apologise for speaking in my native tongue, um, and I thank you all for your attention and also to the translators, who I hope I will not give too hard a job to. Um, in the... 50 years since The Savage Mind was published, it's become, um, happily, it's become commonly understood within the discipline of anthropology anyway, that um, magical and mythic thought is not inferior from scientific thought. Um, it's a happy fact that this is now widely accepted, although as Professor Descalara explained to us yesterday so clearly, the terms of our understanding of it are still under negotiation, we might say. However, something else has changed as well in those last 50 years, and that is the context in which any kind of knowledge can be thought about. Professor Kanyera de Kuna has done as much as anyone, and that is a lot, to point out the important ways in which indigenous thought and knowledge have been recast and repositioned by the development of international laws and precedents uh, based on property thinking in relation to knowledge and heritage. One might distill a difference then from the time of uh, the savage mind um, by saying that it was written before the knowledge economy was envisioned. I should, before I move on, I'm going to be talking about the north coast of Papua New Guinea, uh, a country just north of Australia, and I'm going to be talking about a place in Madang province called Reiti Village, which lies on the right coast of that land. In the first section is called the Magic Garden in Reiti. Before dawn, the gardener rises, and without eating, smoking, chewing beetle, or talking with anyone, he goes to his garden, collecting along the way a set of plants, barks, and leaves, with which he will imbue the ground itself with the power. Sorry? Imbuing the ground itself with the power to grow tubers. The ground has already been cleared. His siblings and their wives and children have labored to clear the ground of trees and scrub. He has set fire to the remains and divided the garden into blocks and paths, all already allocated to particular members of his family for particular purposes, especially earmarked for exchanges and ceremonies that he knows will demand his or their input during the coming year. The garden is indeed already full of other people, anticipating the growth and transformations of their bodies in its very form and conception. Standing at, the, standing at very first light in the centre of his garden, the gardener makes what is called the eye or the shoot of the garden. He demarcates a small area and within it places cooling plants, plants that make sorcery and illness ineffective, plants that will imbue the taro in the whole garden with strength, with perfume and with savour, with bones so that it doesn't turn to mush when cooked, with colour and longevity, and other plants that encourage by their vigorous growth, they encourage the taro to grow vigorously as well. He places plants there that will guard it in the gar garden, <clears throat> causing hideous boils in any who will step over them. Finally, he places a staff for the spirit mother of taro to hang her string bag from, and calling her name, he requires her to return from the distant places to which she has traveled in the intervening years since he last made a garden. Then, breathing the name of the taro deity over a tuber and shredding the same barks and leaves into the space around it in the earth that the deity himself specified, the gardener finishes his work by chewing a stem and spitting its juice of fine spray from his mouth to seal the work. He walks respectfully and quietly from the garden without disturbing the now sleeping and present taro. Later that day, his wife and children will come and begin the task of planting baby taro through the rest of the garden noting for, each block who, for whom each block is planted and using the appropriate people in, such ca in each case. So if a block will contribute to a child's gift to her mother's brother, this child and her siblings will lead the planting in that particular area. Each place, each small group in this landscape has a unique form of this sh central shoot for a garden. The shape, the actual constitution of the mix that makes up what is planted there and what grows there are all different. These forms of planting are jealously guarded. Gardening is an art, then, in Reiti. People take enormous pride in their gardens and produce. 
In the careful and intricate ritual and magical preparations of the garden, we see thought and effort, to, effort directed to the future, to the anticipated and imagined outcomes of the effort. What is being anticipated? Is it something mystical and unreal that will be the result of the application of all this magic? Of course not. It is, in fact, the generation and regeneration of the human world itself. No wonder people are proud. No wonder they take trouble. But what are all those special plants and procedures in the eye of the garden doing? Levi Strauss worked to ensure that the recognition, sorry, worked to ensure the recognition of native thought as valid knowledge making practices and to demonstrate its characteristic within his overall conception of a universal character to the human mind. Hence the delineation of the different modes in which scientific and mythic thought occur based on diff different emphases in relation to the makeup of meaningful structures. Living before the knowledge economy, there was no need to reflexively critique what the notion of knowledge itself was doing in this. The important thing was to recognize and then delineate the characteristics of thought in different systems. As he said, both approaches are equally valid. I have a concern, which you have begun to pick up on already, I imagine, that in the current climate, we must combine an appreciation of primitive thought with a critique of our blindness to its actual effects, just as Levi Strauss did. That is, I'm afraid, that is indeed a political and an intellectual matter, as it, is the, as it is the way that blindness is made possible by our own constructions of the social that makes for a mistranslation of magic as an erroneous or deflected logic of causality, leaving it to science and its judgments to find the real causes behind the use of a plant, leaving it open to colonization, in fact, through the very subtle mechanisms of modernity's purification of real from social. Now all this has been said before, so here is what I think I might be adding. Realising that magic in the garden in Reiti is not to retrospectively understand causality, but making possible future effects. It does so by, pos by positioning the gardener and the plants, the growing tubers and their sweeteners, strengtheners, supporters and competitors in the human world a world constituted by the history of that place and the people who inhabit it. Tauroniam are made human by being made in the human. They have their particular effects on particular bodies, making those bodies grow into reiti bodies because they carry their own relationality as what they actually are. As they move, reproduce, are consumed and facilitate their, ongoing, their own ongoing reproduction as types of reiti tuber and person through this cycle. Magic, then, is not about a retrospective concern over cause and effect here. It certainly is not a defective logic. It is about creating the conditions under which things have their particular effects. Now, <clears throat> a vast array of things, practices, processes, and techniques are thought of as knowledge these days. But it is quite obvious that when many different things are understood as versions of the same class of thing, then internal differentiation, ranking, and relative valuation become preoccupations. This is particularly true for Western people who view knowledge as the basis for human domination and control over their environment, the identification and exploitation of potential resources, and thus of wealth creation. The scale against which the value of knowledge is currently judged is then one that places effectiveness as paramount. Indeed, things are judged as true or false, as knowledge or error, depending on various measures of effectiveness. Within this process of classification and rank ranking, there may be room for understanding different kinds of effects, and they may range from direct visible physical change, scientific intervention, to effective organization of people and resources, management, the prediction of behavior, economics, or moral, historical, and aesthetic awareness, arts and humanities. In these divisions, one that seem natural to Euro-Americans, two assumptions are apparent. First, that knowledge is something that can be and is regularly detached from the people who produce it and use it. That it can circulate without reference to those persons. Its effect is not dependent on them or their position and historical circumstance. The second is that the correlation of true knowledge with effective action on the external environment sets the conditions for valuation, with the most valuable being knowledge that always works everywhere. 
Now, what I'm going to try and do in my short time here is set out a different conception of knowledge, also in two senses. That is, following the example and understanding of people on the Rye Coast of New Guinea, I render a description of knowledge that I hope is going to be slightly unfamiliar. I proceed by a consideration of magic, an archetypal form of erroneous understanding in Western, Western thought, in order, to, in order to, to achieve a sense of knowledge on the Rye Coast, I discuss what magic is and what it does for people there. I'm trying to return it, in a sense, to a form not constrained by the implications of being knowledge, as I have just tried to explain it in the Western sense. Following from this, I'm going to discuss effectiveness of Rye Coast people's practices with plants, locating the effect of these practices in other persons and their actions. I thus seek to demonstrate that these practices are effective, that is not erroneous beliefs, but actions with effects in the particular place of their use. Now, however, I do note that doing this invites a, invites a further move to distinguish what is really effective about their use, i.e. universal and not dependent on their position, and what is cultural or social embellishment or tradition. I reject that distinction much as I think Levi-Strauss would have done, based as it is in the terms of one possible rendering of knowledge, which I've described above as dominant Euro-American. Instead, I follow philosophers and historians of science who show that our judgments of effectiveness in dualistic terms are also located in a particular history, in particular places, just as Rykos' understandings of effectiveness are. While Rykos people privilege positioning things in relation to other things as if they were all persons, Western judgments of knowledge privilege effect on an external world of nature and natural forces. Of course, the fact that doing so is also to position things with regard to persons in a modernist episteme of duality and separation is exactly what cannot be revealed in the Western conception of knowledge for it to stand as knowledge. It is necessarily obscured in the production of effectiveness as exactly an effect independent of particular persons. And for that to be possible, of course, nature must be precipitated as the very register of effect. I'm sorry, I have to just get to this. Okay, so in order to address these issues, I'm going to move from the discussion of magic and effect through a discussion of myth as the structuring of conceptual and social relations on by, in both Rye Coast and Euro-American modes including intellectual property as a form of myth that Western knowledge producers tell themselves to situate their actions. I end with an examination of the oft mistaken analogy of myth with law by anthropologists and suggest that what does link Rykos practices with Euro-American knowledge is that judgments of effect are necessarily placed by history. Okay, the next section is called leaving the magic out. In July 2010, Pore Anombo and I were fortunate enough to launch our co-authored book about indigenous plant knowledge at the nearest university to his village in Papua New Guinea. The book we launched was the product of a long-term collaboration between Pore and myself, begun as a modest private enterprise in 1995. Back then, Porer asked if I would make a book for him recording how he used plants from the forest and old garden sites. The book, the book has chapters on material culture, garden ritual, medicinal plants, initiation, divination, and hunting. The project grew from there over a couple of editions that I printed privately and bound myself and returned on subsequent visits. It grew from that into this, what you see here, the cover of an Australian National University ePress volume which is available as a free PDF download if anyone's interested, or you can print it as a hard copy. The book provides information on over 100 plant species, um, information about what they're used for, and a discussion of the context for ownership of such knowledge provided respectively by Rati Customs and Global Intellectual Property Precedents. We jointly examined what it might mean in the, cl in the climate of the latter expanding and colonizing precedents to call the information in the book knowledge. The text is presented throughout in both English and the lingua franca of Papua New Guinea. Now the Papua New Guinean students in the audience that day were rigorous in their questioning of our presentation. We were congratulated. Surely the book made a record of important knowledge 
It demonstrated indigenous science, the value of custom. It was excellent to see it published in the Lingua Franca. But was it not true that the uses of plants recorded in the book were dependent on certain ritual procedures to be effective? Were there not secret formulae that specific people had rights over involved in those uses? What gave us the right to include such understandings? Or, if in fact, as many in the audience had divined, there was in fact something missing from the book, that is, the magical formula, then was there, in the end, any use in publishing the thing? Now, of course, the questions about ownership and the right to reveal the information was interesting but I hope to show how the fact that the questions came in a rather unexpected form made them particularly interesting in another sense than that of resisting appropriation. The articulation was not about exploitation by outsiders or the threat of bioprospecting. Rather, the question is focused on where the plants had come from, if Porea himself was responsible for their application in Reiti, and if others in the village didn't have rights over the use of them because they, that is the plants, were connected through kinship to different ancestors. Now, of course, we'd already thought, thought much of this through before publication, and Porea was able to answer most informatively. Yes, the plants used in order to encourage the growth of taro, for example, and the form of those plantings, were the ones that he had learned and inherited during specific life cycle events. His right to use them had been paid for by transfers of wealth and produce at those moments. The uses recorded in our book were different from things other people might do with the same plants. Poro was indeed meticulous throughout our collaboration to include only plants that he had direct understanding of and that he could trace the root, that is people, kinship, through which he knew them. So Poro was in no way fearful of accusations that he was claiming or appropriating something to himself. But the care he took does demonstrate that there is a potential issue about the relation between persons involved. The use of the names, and they are called paru in the local language New Guinea, the use of paru, of people named in myth and tunes from those myths, are a crucial part of the effect of many of the plants in our book. And, though, and as those students perceived, we have not included them. For indeed, what members of that audience called secret names or bits of talk are not simple formulae, but they are expressions of connections to others. When questioned about leaving these names from our record, Porer responded as follows. I assure you that even though we did not include the Paru, I do know them. Every plant I put in the book I learned about from my father's and mother's brothers, so I do know them. If I chose to put them in, there is no one who can say anything to me. They don't know these Paru. I responded, but the particular plants which have paru associated the, with them will not work for anyone reading the book without the paru. Poré said, Children and grandchildren seeing them can come and ask me, and I will give them to them. I have already taught many people the lime powder divination, for example. They can pass this on to their children and grandchildren. They can learn these things and teach others. Lots of kids who see this book can come and ask me, or others, to know more. And I will say to them, you sit quietly, don't rush at this. These things have hard work associated with them and I will not force you to learn them. Now Poré here refers to stringent and long-lasting taboos on food and sexual relations that learning paru require if they are to, in Reiti idiom, stick to the person who learns them. He went on. The real reason for my interest in writing the book is we have seen that children and grandchildren may forget these things. If we don't put them on paper, they will be lost. So I wanted to stimulate interest by putting them on paper. I think the message in Poré's response is clear. If you want these things to work for you, come and talk to me or others who have received them through the right channels. Come and ask respectfully and I will give them, but they are not simple keys. There is hard work involved. That is, years of particular kinds of tailored behavior and actions relating to other people. You can have them, but know what it is you're getting into. Poirot expressed clearly for him that knowledge of these names is particular relations to specific others, and through them, particular relational effects. The next section is called Locating Effect. 
Knowing particular garden procedures or divination techniques was part of what becoming the person Porer is, that is, these are clan names, a ripianalysis man with particular paternal, maternal, and a final connections entailed. Porer told us that he had been given recognition as a person, a person who was in a position to receive and utilize these names and plants by the acceptance of pigs and shells and other things by his mother's brothers and his wife's kin during the course of many ceremonies. That what we were calling knowledge of plants was in fact part of his relation to them, and thus part of his position, his very constitution, you might say. The incorporation of those practices in a mythic structuring of relations between kin positioned him as the right person to understand these specific practices. Now, Porer is indeed acknowledged as an expert on custom, healing, and so forth on the Rye Coast, but he is not a special or extraordinary type. All adults have such distinctive aspects of their practices. It is these distinctive practices and their roots of transmission that makes one place and one person different from another. What Reiti custom practices that produce such differentiated persons offer us theoretically, I suggest, is a vivid example of what Roy Wagner has termed a differentiating symbolization, in which everyone is particular because they are actively and consciously constituted in unique relations to others. Their bodies are different because they are grown from particular places and particular nurture contain different relations to others through unique myths and histories. And knowledge is part of that particularity. It is what allows them to have specific effects and capacities. Now in this context, myth is of course anything but abstract, as Levi-Strauss was so at pains to make clear. The principles of differentiation embodied in myth continually provide a practical distribution a concrete positioning for persons and their actions in the constitution of a particular world. For example, there are many Reiti myths about elder and younger brothers in which the younger differentiates himself through an action not specified by precedent and thus makes a change in the world itself occur. In each case, different ways of being a person emerge and a group or place comes into being as a particular and located separate entity with particular practices in relation to situated and animate aspects of their surroundings. There are also many myths of transformation between animal and human, transformations that occur due, due to various mistakes or slights, or again due to a youth not following ancestral ways and instruction. One gets a sense, in fact, in Reiti, of a world in which everything would have been fine and peaceful if people did not have the tendency to differentiate themselves from others. But being human is to suffer such conceit. Thus, human life as a differentiated existence with gender, kinship, places, etc., is the product of differentiation in myth. Of course, that means exchange and reproduction. It also means sorrow, disease, and anger. It means people have different ways of being because of their different locations in this mythically structured distribution. They have different ways of making things such as gardens grow or bodily transformations in initiation happen. Action then is situated as creative because it is differentiating and thus transformative. Knowledge here then is what makes one person different from another and that is a matter of relational position. Now this realization, I hope, allows us to approach the question of knowledge afresh, as it were. There's a couple of my favorite garden magicians. Next section is called what, called what Do Bits of Talk Do? In the Reiti Plants book, Porer and I relate an incident that tells us much about what plants are and do in Reiti, how they fit with their social theory, as it were. The plant in question is one that Reiti Reiti people use to wash newborn babies. Parents make a bed of it within which a newborn is cradled at the moment at which they are passed out of the house in which they've been born to their mother's brother, who sees them at that moment for the first time. He washes the child for the first time and with his kin shows the baby how to garden, hunt, climb trees and so forth. What is achieved by this procedure? Well, we might say birth is not achieved until the child is recognized by a related person outside their immediate family. It is this specific other who shows it gardening, hunting, etc., for the first time, 
and in fact thus can claim to be the origin of these abilities in the child and subsequently claim wealth in recognition of their achievements. There is no generic gardening. There are specific ways of making gardens that distinguish particular places and people. It should be clear that what the, mother brother, what the mother's brother knows is passed on at this moment to the child, and that is a matter of making them accept the child and the substitute wealth and meat that accompany the plate. It is then a matter of placing the child in a particular relationship, the form of which determines their subsequent growth and development. In the plants book, I made much of the fact that I wanted to know what this plant, which is called asasing, does for the child. Why do they use it? What are its properties? What particular properties make asasing the plant chosen for washing and cradling the newborn child? Well, the answer to these questions came without hesitation in the form of a myth. My contention is that by answering my question about an intrinsic property of a plant through situating its effectiveness as an aspect of a relation to specific named ancestors in the myth, to specific procedures which made a, make the child a human child by a relation to, a, to particular kin who will make it appear as that child and not as something else, that in doing this, the work of the plant is to situate the child in relation to particular ancestors. To be human in reality is to be in particular relations to other persons. In fact, the myth is wholly practical. What could be more practical than providing a frame for action in which that action is situated in relation to a series of actions that produce the world in human reiti form? What we might call magic, that is paru, and mythically specified forms of action are the way that reiti people have of affecting the emergence of particular kinds of human person. Humans are human beings because they are always entrained in, extensions of, differentiated versions of, and obligated to others. By using paru, a gardener, or a healer, or a hunter, positions an action, or a thing, or a set of practices in relation to other things, other people. To know is to be in a particular relation to others in which specific effects are generated and recognized. Now this makes what he knows look very different from the characterization of knowledge as a series of individually held representational propositions about nature that can be judged as true or erroneous with reference to their effective engagement with aspects of that nature. I have one more substantial section called Making Things Called Knowledge. The conception of knowledge as an individual possession applicable to an external nature is obviously characteristic of a particular history and society, one in which scientific symbolization is dominant and one that has given rise to laws such as intellectual property to administer the connection between knowledge as an object and people as creators or rights holders. Indeed, the kinds of problems that result in a broadly Durkheimian theorization of society which arise in this milieu begin from the premise of individuation. Human beings are individually specified as unique bodies by internal natural properties. Durkheim's brilliance was in providing a convincing picture of how something, that is society, is made from individual actions and understandings that transcend and come to reciproc reciprocally structure common perception. But certain blind spots or issues arise within what Roy Wagner calls this collectivizing mode of symbolization. One is the problem of individual versus collective. Another, of collective coordination. People are seen as naturally different. Experience is individual and unique. They are socialized into particular collectivities that share representations about the world external to them. Now this is well-rehearsed territory and by people in this room as well. And I'm not going to elaborate it further here. But we are very much in the realm of the problematics of Euro-American social theory. But I do want to dwell for a moment on the fact that knowledge is very interestingly placed in this construction. My point is that our conception of knowledge is also an aspect of this view of the world, and that has consequences. Wagner argues that, there, that to think there is something called knowledge in this mode is to think that there is something humans collectively create and construct separate from the actual reality of the world. Unlike in the Rykost material presented above, knowledge is not part of being. 
It is a series of representations of a reality on which being does depend, but is separate from. Knowledge is variable because there are different human collectivities. And all this in turn rests on, a, on, a, on an assumption that there is something to be constructed from or against. That is a given world of nature. The very use of the term knowledge therefore implies in this formulation a radical distinction between what is constructed as knowledge, that is human artifice, and what is constructed against, that is a given world. Knowledge can be false and falsified re with reference to this external given reality, which is, with which it has no necessary connection. Porer, however, talks about knowledge as remembering, as acting, as thinking on an experience or moment of transmission between persons. It is clear, I hope, that what he describes is acting in and on relations, not a representation or a thing at all. Now, in the same tradition that I'm characterizing by reference to the Durkheimian legacy here as a, as a shorthand, Myth, magic, and belief are understood as either erroneous belief based on faulty representation or a superstition with certain social function. Put simply, people are thought to be aware of a force above and beyond them that guides and structures their action. Myth and magic can then at one time be considered to be socially real but untrue. To see this as a consequence of linked conceptions of human nature, culture, and belief allows us as analysts, I think, to move on to understanding how part of the worldview that gives us myth and magic versus history and science also needs to assume the concept of nature. Knowledge slots into place, into the place of being about nature, a representational project with accuracy and truth determined by the fit between representation and effect on the external world of nature. Judgments about the value of knowledge are dependent on its effect on nature, on a given world, and other to the representation itself. There is a consequent re relegation of practices which are not knowledge in this sense to the realm of culture. Now intellectual property has been referred to several times in this meeting as relevant to the discussion. I venture here to suggest that the view of myth appropriate to a collectivizing symbolization is something akin to a version of law. That is a template that sets out the rules and norms of behavior in a society and demonstrates the consequences of breaking them. It has a real social function, but not one the natives necessarily realize. Myth encodes and perpetuates elements of a culture, such as institutions, rituals, and so forth. Now, I hope you realize that I'm talking about this as a mistake, and an old mistake, discernible, for example, in Malinowski, who thought of Trobriand myth as a form of law, a blueprint for how society has to be run, a record and reference for convention, and I do note that, in fact, Levi-Strauss makes the same critique in The Savage Mind. But the myth I described in Wraith, it rated, provides, the myths I described in Wraith provide the context, as it were, in which context or convention is undone over and again. That is, because myth is specific to places, persons, histories, and relations, and sets out the conditions under which those differences appear, it cannot be the universalizing blueprint or template in which a universal moral or social context is encoded. The subject that the law deals with is the abstract subject as a universal entity, the same as the subject of Durkheimian sociological analysis. Law has been thought of as, as equivalent to myth in the understandings generated by conventionalizing symbolization because it is the way that certain actions are already placed, not for specific people, but for everyone. It is the universalizing function which makes all actions the same before distinguishing them through methods of classification. Law partakes of and contributes to the worldview in which knowledge is representational, representational of universal truths about the world, external to the perceiver. The actions of each person can then be understood against this universal and external reality, not as specific to their mode of differentiation. Now, what Wagner and Eduardo Vivies de Crastro suggest in, is that much of what passes as magic could be understood in an alternative anthropological approach that sees the practice of, rather than the belief in, magic as crucial. The pra that practice is one whereby actions, events, people and things are situated, of ensuring that through this positioning they are correctly recognized. 
So I would like to suggest that in Reiti, paru are not culture, or belief, or superstition. Myth is not an encoded version of universal norms. Paru are modes of having effects on others by positioning actions and persons in relation to others. So instead of viewing myth as a blueprint for action, we might do well to understand law itself as a kind of myth in a collectivizing ontology. It is a way of situating actions in a given and universally applicable set of norms, an appropriate situation in that construction. That is, people's creations are already positioned in relation to other persons and things through the practices around and assumptions supporting the law. My suggestion then is not that we think of Ryko's myth as primitive law, but of intellectual property as an equivalent to the structuring condition of myth in Reiti. It provides, in this case, a fixed context in which actions can be understood. Now, I suggest that this conceptual move was in fact indicated by the responses to our book launch towards an analysis of the relations in which persons and objects come to have their effects. My suggestion is that the work of calling vastly disparate things knowledge, the work that calling vastly disparate things knowledge does, is to situate them in a kind of mythic structure partially embodied by intellectual property law, to determine their substance and thus to position people and things in a moral and social universe. What effects does it have then in all this to say that knowledge is contextual, that it's cultural? <clears throat> Making Porea's practice into cultural knowledge means we can see its value perhaps as heritage or culture, but not, uh, not really as effective, verifiable knowledge. Indeed, let us remind ourselves that our idea of knowledge emerged alongside the idea of nature, that for us knowledge is representation of nature, because the notion of knowledge we operate makes little sense without nature on which we can see its effects. In other words, we've translated the world and divided its peoples exactly along the expression-utility divide that is enshrined in intellectual property law but between the decorative arts and the useful arts. And that is my evidence for making the experimental suggestion that intellectual property law might usefully be seen as an elaboration of a structuring, structuring myth that we live by. That's a very short conclusion. In this paper, I've tried to show that it might be possible to return Reiti magic to a form that is not constrained by the term knowledge as it is generally understood in Euro-American discourse. I, under I undertook this endeavor because it seems that placing magical practices in relation to knowledge does two things to them. It invites contextualization to show how they could be seen as socially effective, but in that, not as true knowledge. In doing so, making the comparison on our, ter our terms leaves it as an inferior, leaves it as inferior to representations of the world that can be utilized to make changes to natural things or processes unmediated by other human beings. I've tried to show that for us to approach Poirot's practices with plants, we need a recognition of equivalence which is not based on an underlying premise of knowledge as that, as that which can be applied anywhere by anyone, as that in turn relies on a separation of social and natural which obviates the possibility of seeing the effect of his actions. Thinking through the students' questions at that university has made, I quote, legible the particularity of supposedly natural or scientific categories. And that was Saskia Sasson. Poirot's speech at Divine Word University was not a claim to authorship. In fact, we can see here how the critique of authorship that's been so powerful and useful elsewhere would miss its mark in the context we're discussing. His is a much more interesting claim than that of sole creation or authorship of the material in the plants book, and one which involves us rethinking the category of knowledge itself. I hope I've shown how for him, leaving the magic out was not a con or a mistake, but a clear recognition on his part of the existing and potential, potential relational effects of Paru and indeed the book. To be effective, both, th both things and people must have the correct orientation they must take the requisite form. What happens when we call this knowledge is a different matter. So thinking through the questions we were asked at the launch of Rati Plants has suggested the need to analyze what knowledge is in different places and why plants may be effective in some, but not in others. 
I have attempted here to avoid an explanation of effect based on the notion of society or the social, and in its place establish a frame in which all knowledge is located, specific, and reliant on particular processes of making human worlds appear. Thank you.